<laughs> hello everyone, hello, can you all hear me? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt any conversations. But I wanted to thank you all for coming to tonight's selection. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to also remind everyone about some of the other we are Tacoma events that we have coming up in the month of May. Um, when you all came in today, you may have seen the uh, exhibition, the art exhibition Spanda. Um, that's an exhibition which opened today, which features the work of multimedia artist Shanti, I may say her last name incorrectly, Chan Chandran Sekar. Um, the exhibition opens today, and it'll be running through June 30th. So you're in the lecture now. You can't actually do two things at once. But <laughs> please come back um, and take in all the work that's there. On Saturday, May 7th, there will be a screening of the film 120 Days. And that'll be a pre-screening of the film, which is a part of the Greater Washington Immigration Film Festival. Showtime will be at 7.30. On Thursday, May 12th, also at 7.30, there will be a performance piece, Parables of War, which uses dance, documentary, and drama to pose the question, how can civilization bind the wounds of war? That should be really interesting. On Saturday, May 14th at 8 o'clock, there'll be another dance show, uh, dance, Treasure, dance Treasures of Ubekistan. The award-winning Silk Road Dance Company dances and celebrates traditional women's dance from the region and provides a glimpse into a culture unfamiliar to most Americans. On Thursday, May 19th, will be the monthly, monthly Third Thursday Poetry Series. Um, and that starts at 7.30. And that's always great. And a lot of folks actually come out. So if there are any poets in the audience, hint, hint, um, please don't hesitate to come and participate. On Saturday, May 21st, will be Quiet Life Motel 20912, a serendipitous multimedia show featuring audio artist and violinist David Shulman. Uh, and lastly, will be a few workshops. On uh, Monday, May 23rd at 7 p.m., there'll be a writing a village workshop, which is a monthly poetry workshop for uh, seasoned poets or aspiring poets, and also a photo salon, which is a monthly photo salon for photographers who want to show their work and also have their work critiqued. So that's happening in the month of May, a really busy month. But for the reason you all came here this evening, uh, I'm pleased to welcome Jeannie Drews, a uh, special guest from the Library, Library of Congress. Ms. Drews has been, a chief, has been the chief of the Binding and Collection Care Division since 2006, where she's developed new and innovative processes to manage long-standing collections management issues and has developed the Family Treasures website, a site that provides advice and help in preserving family treasures, heirlooms, antiques, and collectibles. Tonight, she'll be speaking to us about Cuban art and culture through Ediciones Bejia, a book collective in Mantanzas, Cuba. Ms. Drews will be examining the, this independent publishing house and will also offer some of her personal book collection for viewing and discussion. Now, was it, was I right, right with personal? Are. Okay. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, uh, please give a very warm welcome to Ms. Jeannie Drews. Thank you. Um, so yeah, binding collections care, what does that mean? I take care of the general collections at the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress is usually considered to be the largest collection in the world. I don't know, British Library is pretty big. Um, but 165 million uh, pieces at the Library of Congress. Um, I'm responsible for about 34 million, give or take. And I say give or take because anywhere from six to 10,000 pieces a day come into our building get added to our collection. And so if you think that paper is gone, wrong. So, um, but um, I'm here to talk about Cuba and um, my adventures there. So I was very fortunate to, uh, I worked at Johns Hopkins in preservation, my specialty area is preservation. And, oops, that was the wrong button. I pushed the wrong button. 
I pushed the wrong button. What happened to it? Okay, he's going to take care of this. I, I thought I'd push the right button, the correct button. I'm sure you did. But not, not quite correct. This way. Okay. This one. This one. Okay. So Cuba, 90 miles off our shore. Um, we have, of course, had this long-standing embargo against Cuba over 50 years. But just something that we don't think about, I think, as Americans, is that we have this embargo against Cuba, but the rest of the world wants to go to Cuba. So just in case you didn't think about it that way. So when I went to Cuba, I was asked to go to Cuba to help with preservation issues at the National Archives. And um, so there were Germans there and lots of Canadians and, of course, lots of people from Spain. And uh, so lots of Europeans, the Swedes love Cuba, go there when it's, you know, it's cold in Sweden and they go to, go to Cuba. So 90 miles off our shore, we uh, are now, um, Cuba is opening up uh, for Americans to go there, uh, although the embargo is still in place, not yet gone. Um, so you can go on an education license, and I always went um, with a license um, through, the, through the university. So there it is. We can see uh, very close um, to Miami, and the last few times that I went to Cuba, I went, I, flew, I could fly directly through to, from Miami to Havana, but uh, in the first few times that I traveled to Cuba, that was not yet possible, so I had to fly through the Bahamas, or um, I could have gone up to Canada and then flown in, <laughs> but I, I went through the Bahamas or through, um, through Mexico. So Ediciones Vigia, it is a book cooperative um, that started in 1985. Um, Matanzas is called the Athens of Cuba. Um, there's a beautiful opera house there. Um, there's a university there. And it's called the Athens of Cuba because there's so much, well, all of Cuba is creative. And Cubans generally are very creative, inventive, smart, um, friendly people was what I found. Um, but Matanzas, as the Athens, is this very cultural, like the cultural center in some ways. Um, and why did I go there? There's a regional archive there that holds the um, slave registries. And uh, Franklin Knight, who um, was a professor at Johns Hopkins, and I worked at Johns Hopkins, and he was, when he met me, he said, you need to go to Cuba and help preserve those slave registries because I need to use them for my research. And so I said, OK, I'm happy to do that. And so that was actually how I wound up in Matanzas and then um, met the, the Bahia people. So uh, Bahia is for the watchtower. They're on the watchtower. Um, it's a square. And so they're named after that, where their, their um, building is on the square. Um, these are, this was my first visit uh, to Cuba. And um, um, uh, Raul is the young man there. He's, he's a student at, at the, yes. Um, I was there in 96, um, and then my last trip was there in 2002. Um, so in between, during that time was the special period after the break of the Soviet Union and when they weren't giving support to Cuba anymore. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is Laura, and the reason you see that big smile on Laura's face, I was uh, there and I was buying books, and um, so I asked the the, the people who were there, um, if there were any uh, people who, you know, were the authors of the books, because I would like to have my book signed. You know, you can go to an author signing and you have somebody sign your book. And so Laura said, it's very interesting because they do the illustrations of some of the more scholarly books are designed by children. So the illustrations are by the children, or the artwork is by the children for scholarly books. And then some of, the, some of the very best designers do the children's books. That's not always true, but it, they just sort of mix it up. Um, and so Laura was smiling because she said, well, my son did the illustrations for this book, and I could sign for him. <laughs> and I said, oh, that would 
bring me the greatest pleasure if you would do that for me. To and so right there on the title page, you know, there where it said illustrator and, and her son's name, she wrote his, she signed for him. So um, Bahia, it's a cooperative. It's made up of about a dozen people who, when they started in 1985, they wanted a way to, to share their creative endeavors. Most of them are authors. They could be poets, short story writers. And they wanted to be able to share that with the community. So when they started out in 1985, they just did poetry readings. And they would take, they would print up these, or handwrite uh, in the very beginning, these little cards that they would take around and post to say, you know, there's going to be a poetry reading. Not, not too dissimilar from what you do here in Tacoma Park uh, and in Tacoma, where you bring together people to have poetry readings like, uh, like um, we just heard about that's going to happen later in the month of May. And so they would do this, and they had, their, they had this space with a patio. We'll see, see a little bit more of that in just a moment. And so they would do these poetry readings where there are the poets would come around and they would just read. And so then they wanted to do something a bit more. They really wanted to be able to have their, they wanted to publish. And so they found this old mimeograph machine, Russian style, and they got the paper. They used bagas. This brown paper here is called bagas. It's the outer core. It's, it's sort of like our craft paper. Um, it's used for the butcher, you know, to wrap the meat in or the fish. And so um, Matanzas is famous for uh, sugar cane and uh, to do the sugar. So you use the outer core of the sugar to make the paper. So they have the sugar cane um, manufacturers. And right next, they have the plants for paper making. And they make this bagasse. Um, and so right there in, Mat in Matanzas, they went and they said, we want your offcuts. So, you know, the scrap that isn't being used from the, from the paper mills. And so they used that. So they used that, and then they said, well, what can we do to decorate our books? And in some cases, they would use dirt. They used coffee grounds. Used coffee grounds, not fresh. But after they made their coffee, then they would use the coffee grounds. They used bird seed. They used gravel. They used sawdust. They used little bits of candles that they couldn't burn anymore to use the wax. They used whatever they could find, bits of, bits of fabric. Can you see here they have this? This one's got some fabric on it. Um, whatever they could. They would bring all of this stuff together, and then they would do a design. So they would design these books, and they would have one piece um, that would be the designer, and would design something, and that would be the model. And then they would take their materials, and however much materials they had for the book, they would do an addition. So now they do editions of 200, 250, but in the old, in the old days, um, in, the era, in the late 80s, they might only do an edition of 100 because they wouldn't have enough materials. So each of the books is handmade and just a little bit different from the next one. So they numbered all of them the way rare books are numbered or, or limited editions are numbered. And so each one of these books has a number. It could be 45, it could be 150, whatever, um, of, the, of the materials. And all of them are, are, um, are numbered. Some of them are signed because I got the signatures. So this group of a dozen people. So Cuba's a socialist country, and publishing is controlled by the government. So it's only official publishing that is sanctioned by the government and is controlled by an editorial board that uh, decides what's going to be published. And, and uh, th that's the way books are produced in Cuba, except for people like Bahia, who are sort of under the radar and do these small um, editions with materials that they get, um, that are, it, so it isn't official. And that's where all of these came from. 
Now, the Hia is official. And why? Because they've become famous, and their books are selling around the world. And so the government, of course, wants a piece of that. <laughs> Not surprisingly. So um, Laura and Raul, let's see if it, there. So this is the upper floor. There are two floors. Um, and this is the work area. So you can see these long tables. And this is where they would do the assembly. So as I said, there would be a, there would be a design for the book. And everyone would look at the design. And then they would all sit around the table. And they would do it sort of uh, uh, assembly line. You would do one piece at a time. And you do all, all 200 or however many you were doing. You would do all of one piece. So for example, and I worked with them, so I so I know where, uh, what of I speak, um, you'd, you'd glue on this part. And you'd look at the model and so, OK, it needs to be at this kind of an angle. And then this piece goes on top. And, and you're hand coloring it. And you would do that. Or you would be cutting out pieces. And you'd cut out and for 200 of them, or whatever the addition was. And then you would try and make them all look, look as much alike as possible um, with the alteration of different pieces when you ran out of a, of a color or if you ran out of fabric. Or, or some of these, for example, that has the, this has blue yarn, but it might have red yarn or something like that. So you would sit assembly line. And so I, I was fortunate in that I was able to work with them and be part of this assembly. Um, that wasn't the first time that I went the first time I just bought books from them. But after that, as I got to know them and I found out what they needed, I would bring them supplies. And, um, and then they would, they, so the way they get paid is by books. So they would, you know, if you helped do assembly of the books, maybe you would get two of those books. If you were the, if you were the author of the book for that particular book, you'd maybe get five or 10. So, and if you were the illustrator, you'd get you know, somewhere in between there. And everyone worked together. So you might be, and there was this group that would select what was going to be published based on what was submitted. And so maybe you would be the, the author, um, and it would be a book of your poetry. And the next time, you would be an assembler, and you'd be gluing on the little silver half moons, as I, as I say. There's one with the half moons that I helped work on that I can show you. So I was in Cuba officially from the university. And I worked with the National Archives and the National Library and the Provincial Archives. I raised about $500,000 worth of supplies that I shipped legally to Cuba. It was only one time I did something. I did bring a scanner to Cuba, I did. And uh, I put it in my suitcase. And um, when I got stopped in the airport with the scanner, uh, they wanted to know why. I, had, and I said, well, I have to have this for my demonstration, because I'm working at the National Archives, and I'm sp speaking. And so I need to have the scanner to demonstrate. And then, amazingly, I forgot to put it in my suitcase when I left. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> they held me for, about, uh, for almost 12 hours at the airport because of that darn scanner. Um, this is not Bahia. This is the archives that's in Matanzas. And what you see here are the slave registries. But for the slave registries, I would not have had opportunity to work um, in, at uh, Ediciones Bahia. So these are the slave registries that Franklin Knight, the professor at Johns Hopkins, he's still a professor there in Latin, in Latin American studies, the specialty area is the is slavery in the, in the Caribbean and in Latin America. And so he was doing research there. And he would travel to Cuba and uh, use the materials here. But they were damaged. And he was concerned about their long-term preservation. And he wanted them for his research. And so he said, well, Jeannie, we need to do something. And the Ford Foundation worked with Franklin Knight and uh, Johns Hopkins and provided funding for the students to actually travel to Cuba during the intercession. Um, excuse me? Yes. No, we didn't scan them. No, what we did was we, we rehoused them. So what did they want? When the first time that I went and visited them, I said, what, what might I do to help? 
Um, I'm a librarian. I'm always saying, can I help you? <laughs> I do that on the metro. Can I help you find your way? It's just, it's, I don't know. It's like my, so I, when I met them, I said, what can I do to help? Um, and they said, well, you know, these slave registries, and Franklin was very, inner, was very eager to do that. And I said, how about a project with the students? So we brought down the materials. And what you see here are Hopkins students um, rehousing the slave registries into acid-free paper and, and tying them up. We put boards on either side. So the, the way they're stored is um, with a card that identifies th that's the cataloging for these slave registries. And so that was really, really important because that work had already been done. And in order for researchers to come and use those slave registries, you have to know the cataloging piece. Yeah. Both. Excellent question. So the, the, the registries are of the slaves both on the plantations, but also on boats that stopped. And sometimes those boats would stop in Cuba to take on uh, food and then go on to the United States and deposit their slaves, the ones that were still alive, of course, um, and sell them. And so those slave registries are, are invaluable for uh, um, American scholars for um, slavery here during the slavery that was here in the United States, as well as in the Caribbean. So what we did was we bought the materials, and we, shipped, we took them down. We carried them down with us. The students carried them, mostly. Uh, big rolls of acid-free paper and boards that were pre-cut to the size. So the way they were, they were tied with sessile twine. So if you know sessile twine, it's very stiff and harsh. And so when you tie it, you would tie it both. You were, you were quartering. You were cutting into quarters the slave registries on the top and bottom because you would tie the sessile twine so tight that it would cut this paper that was very thin and fragile and old. And so what we did was we put boards on either side, we wrapped them in acid-free paper to protect it, and then we would tie it with flat twill tape. And that's what these, these um, students are doing. And what you see around the, the one uh, student's neck, you can see she's pre-cut the white twill and she's ready. So they would have contests to see. They were like, how many, how many should we do, Jeannie? And I said, well, no, you don't want to do them too fast because you want to do it accurately, and you don't want to hurt the materials. But they had teams, and they would um, do as many. And they, they, they wrapped and accurately identified 800. Um, they would work in the morning, and then they went to the beach in the afternoon, and I would go to Vijia and work and helping put together the books. So for me, it was, it was quite perfect, and for the students, it was... It was very perfect. They had been going down to Cuba for four or five years. And the students would come back after this two weeks in, in Cuba. They worked with the University of Havana and would hear lectures and things like that um, to learn about Cuban culture and the government and that sort of thing. And when they would come back to the United States, they would see the huge difference in resources and the way people lived. And then they regretted that they hadn't done something more while they were in Cuba. And so Franklin, so when I went to Franklin and I said, how about a work project? He said, this is perfect, Jeannie, because it will give the students this opportunity to do something in the country that contributes. And so that's why we did these work projects. And we did a couple of them. Um, but this is the one we did in Matanza. So here they are all rewrapped um, and safely put back where they, where they belonged. But back to Bahia. So this was the first trip to Bahia, and you see everyone smiling. There I am with, when I had brown hair before it was gray. Um, and Erin Loftus, who's smiling, that great big smile, she's on, the, she's on um, the right there, as you see her. She got the last, she got the last book that was the um, cigar book. And she was very, very happy that while I had more money to buy books than she had, she got the one that was the last one. So she was very, very happy. And then Joanne Cavanaugh, who was from Johns Hopkins, who was a journalist, and she um, did writing about Cuba, and she was traveling there. And then all the other people are, are uh, the Bahia people. You see Laura again um, and Raul. And then Augustine, Augustina is the lady in the back there, and she uh, is an editor and still works um, still works at, at Bahia. And I don't remember the gentleman's name. I apologize. Um, but we all had our, we had our materials there. 
So um, they have a showroom where they would um, show, show their books to sell. And so uh, Matanzas is about ha halfway. It's on the, the road to Veradero, which is the, the, the nicest, the finest beaches in uh, Cuba, considered. I don't know whether they are or not. Those are superlatives I always wonder about. But beautiful, they are. They are. They are truly beautiful. They are beautiful. White, white beaches. Beautiful, beautiful beaches. Um, which, when I first went there, um, Cubans were not allowed to go to those beaches. They were only for tourists. And so I went, um, and I had a, a Cuban driver, and um, and a Cuban translator, because uh, my Spanish wasn't that great. And um, they said, "Well, will you go to the beach, Jeannie? We'll." We'll wait for you here. And I said, well, well, no, I want you to be my guest. I'll buy you a meal. You've been driving, you know, and uh, yeah. And they said, well, you know, that's not important. And, and I said, no, it's important for me to be, to share this experience with you. And so it was only then that they said, you don't get it, lady. <laughs> We're not allowed on the beach. And I was like, well, then I don't want to be on the beach either. Let's go someplace where we can enjoy food and drink together, um, which is what we did. So the other beaches, there are other beaches before Veradero that are a little bit rockier that are Cuban beaches, and I went there. Um, that's the cigar book. So they had made a cigar box out of... Um, they, they cut it, and they made it, and that's uh, the bookmark from there, and it's the story of uh, tobacco. Um, and you can see, see how they've put it together and decorated it, and they're actually the one that, uh, th then they have a, a cigar. That's the inside of it. I now have one. So, so Aaron has hers, but I, I was able to acquire one, shall we say. Um, here we are working. Um, I didn't bring that book with me. Um, but here we are. Everybody's just in assembly line working, putting them together. And you can see he's uh, cutting out things. Um, scissors were so important. So when we would work, we'd work in the morning, and then they'd take a break and have lunch, and then they'd come back and, we'd work, and, and work some more. And everybody always took their scissors with them. And so I asked about that. And they were like, yeah, well, scissors are pretty precious. And so the next time I came, I brought you know, a dozen scissors. And, and um, I said, well, you know, I'll just leave them here so that there would be scissors enough. Because you know, having good scissors to cut out all of these detail. This is one about Paris. Can you see all of the detail of the cutout of this, that they cut all of those little lines to get that, that um, so having a good pair of scissors is really important. What were they gluing? They glued them with PVA, or uh, with, uh, with a white glue, it wasn't probably PVA, with a white glue, um, and they would water it down so that it would almost not work anymore, and I'd say, I'll bring you some PVA, so I would bring I would bring good adhesive for them. So they would buy whatever adhesive they could. They bought a lot of materials eventually as they got more money. They were able to buy materials. And people brought and donated materials for them too. So I would bring cloth. I'd bring colored pencils. I'd bring uh, um, paint. I'd bring uh, paper, colored paper. I'd bring um, fabric. I would bring uh, scissors. Um, and all, I mean, I'd, I brought all kinds of things to them, as well as to the archives and libraries. But um, the the real they they're very very um, inventive and creative, and they would just find things, um, and it, and just really truly amazing. Um, here they are working. There's another there's another book, um, and that um, so they work with. Americans, here he is cutting out. I think I brought that one with that layout. And he's, he's drawing the image on to then cut out. Um, and here they are working away. There's the white glue you can see. 
it's kind of messy, you know. So I do uh, uh, collections conservation at the Library of Congress, and so everything is very clean and neat, and you have to be you're very careful with what you do with your books. This is a very different, very different experience, but but very fun, and they they got a lot of work done. So here's one of the books, and in fact, I did bring this one with me. So. What do they publish? I said uh, scholarly pieces. I talked about children's books. So they did um, journals. They do a quarterly journal, a uh, revista, that um, sometimes they do a combined one that they've been doing since, uh, the, since the mid 80s. Um, they do a children's uh, revista also. So again, a magazine uh, for the children. They do um, scholarly works. They do bibliographies. They do um, new poets. So they have a prize that they award across uh, the country to uh, up-and-coming poet or up-and-coming um, um, author of, uh, of essayist or, or short stories. And the prize is that they get to be published. So they publish their work as well. Um, Americans, they work with Cuban Americans. So Ruth Bahar, who's a, a Cuban American, she's a professor at the University of Michigan. And uh, I brought a couple of her books here. She's been working with them for many, many years. She probably has she probably has one of the largest collections in the United States. So the Library of Congress has a sizable collection, and you can go and see them. They're in the rare book room, and they can be brought out for your for your perusal. Um, Bill Fisher. Um, who lives in San Antonio, uh, Texas, is, I think, the largest uh, collector in the United States. He collects, he's a book collector. He's been collecting the, the um, everything in regards to the HIA. So he gets the Christmas cards that get sent. He has some of the very, very earliest um, uh, little... Um, sheets that were announcing a poetry reading, a broadside, you would call it. Um, and he's been collecting those. He has letters um, uh, from authors to Vahia who are working on a publication. So um, he's, he's, I think he has one of, the, one of the largest collections. So I have a sizable collection. I've been down there a number of times and bought them. My first collection, I call it my first collection because I donated it. I donated it to the special collections at Michigan State um, Libraries, which was where I was working at the time. Um, and then I started collecting them again. And I am, again, uh, donating uh, the larger part of my collection to um, a library that, where I know they will be used by the students um, at the university. Because I think it's important to, for um, people to understand how how wonderful a publication you can make out of very little. I think too often art students, and I just, um, actually just this past week, I spoke at um, Art, art College of Washington to, their, uh, to a print class. Um, too often they think it has to, you know, you have to have, everything has to be perfect before you can produce something. And I took some of these books, as well as some fine press, to show the difference and to show what they could do with, with very little money because students don't have a lot of money for materials for their, for their portfolio. But they can make really beautiful things that will, that will um, show their skill and their talent. And that's really what they need to do for a portfolio before they graduate. So um, I showed these books um, that way. This is one of my favorite all-time books. Her hair... Um, this beautiful long hair, and the inside of the book, I think I have a picture. Oh, no, I don't. Um, the inside of her hair goes around all of the texts within for the, the text block of the book. So every one of the books has a wonderful cover. So this is a children's book. But in addition, there is a design for the text. In this case, it's feathers. Um, but then see this little, see the little um, boat in a bottle from the front, and it's repeated. So 
Um, I did a traveling exhibition of, this, of these materials that traveled around the United States, and I called it Words in a Frame, because all of the words are framed by the art. Um, and that's true for every single one of them. And so they have a theme. So the design of them, I mean, is, is quite extraordinary. And I, I hope that you will all take time to come up and, and see, uh, see some of, of these books, um, because they don't look the same when you look at them um, on a flat screen. So another early, early edition, this is a, a tissue paper that they would glue down. Um, here you can see there's a piece of metal there. Um, and uh, again, it's all glued on. So uh, this beautiful one, uh, music one, and, and can you see? So they built up the, the musical instrument, the, the, the guitar, or maybe it's the ukulele, um, to give it that, that depth. So they, they really, their, their design uh, capabilities are just extraordinary. So Rolando Estevez. Uh, was one of the founding members, and he is a theater design. Um, what he did originally was theater design and started working with Vahia. And um, he has a very distinctive uh, art, I think. Um, this is one of uh, Esteve's pieces. And he's now, he travels in the United States. He does um, two-dimensional works as well as three-dimensional works and, and um, continues to do designs um, for, for Bahia. This one is uh, this, the, the, the coffee grounds. I mentioned the coffee grounds. That's what you see. The dark that you see there is, are the coffee grounds on, on that book. And those are dried leaves. Um, you might not be able to tell that they're actual dried leaves, but that's what... <laughs> That's what they are. That's a very, very fragile one. I didn't, I didn't bring that one because the dried leaves are, uh, are very fragile. Um, so they do topics. Um, here's a religious one. Um, so in Cuba, of course, um, religion um, was banned for many, many years. Um, but they would do books on religion. They published authors that, uh, the American authors, they have a book of Emily Dickinson's poems. They have, uh, they do American authors. Uh, the, the Emily Dickinson is really wonderful because they built a house that looks like Emily Dickinson's cottage. They found pictures of that. And they built this house, and then the book's inside the house, and the roof comes off. You lift off the roof, so you've, you've heard of book boxes, right? And you've seen these really fine books that are in boxes, specially made to hold the book. Well, in this case, Emily Dickinson's cottage was the box that held the book. Um, um, that's the back of it. So one of the things, the, uh, they have their own logo, um, and it is um, this lantern. So they really are a light. They're shining a light in Cuba with information and knowledge that they're sharing. Their books go to public libraries. In Matanzas, they have a great collection of the, of the Bahia books. And then, of course, the people, as I was saying, they get paid by books. And so when I was down there, because I mean, they knew that I was American and that I had money, and so they would say, come with me. Come visit me at lunchtime. And they would take me to their house, and under their bed, they would pull out this box, and here they would have all of these books. And then they would sell, them bo sell their books to me for, for American dollars, because when I was first going down there, American dollars were, was, was currency. Uh, in the same way that the, that the Cuban peso was currency. That's not true anymore. Um, of course, that, that, that changed. Here's one of the children's books um, with the gate and open and the kids on it. Um, and then they, did a lot, they do a lot of, of banners that um, are either part of the book as an as a, um, added um, accompanying materials is what we call them in libraries. We, when um, you have a children's book, for example, and maybe um, there, are, there are paper dolls with the children's book, or sometimes children's books come with uh, um, puzzles or, or cars or, I mean, I, I get hundreds and I get thousands of those at the Library of Congress from copyright, the, the new children's books. And the children's books today, you know, have all these things that come with them, and we box them all up to hold them all together. And what they do at Vahia 
is they have accompanying materials that are a part of the book. So it could be a banner with a special poem, or it could be, um, it could be a fan that's attached to the front of the book and um, tied on. And when you open up the fan, if I can get it out, And you'll see that image on the inside of that book as well. And they've made the fan with, you know, with just paper and then hooked it together with a, with a grommet. So I was inspired by what these people do in their creative um, endeavors. And so I wanted to support them. And I did that by buying their books and by sharing their books with others so that others would go to them um, when they traveled to Cuba. And then, of course, I brought the materials. And the greatest gift, of course, that I got was that I got to work with them to help them assemble these books so that I felt um, I understood um, their methodology. And working in Cuba, working in the National Archives and the, the National Libraries, there's a real hierarchy there. Um, now it's a socialist com country, and I think of socialism as everybody being equal, and we all pitch in and do the work. And I have to say that Adiciona's Bahia group was the most socialist group of any that I worked with in Cuba. They really did help each other, and they did consider each other equal. So they could be doing assembly work, and I could be sitting next to a very famous Cuban poet, and I was on several occasions, and was in awe by her poetry. And she was sitting there next to me, gluing on silver half moons the same way I was, um, because it wasn't her time to have for it to be her book. It was somebody else's book, and she was helping do the assembly for it. Um, My time in Cuba changed me. Um, it made me, resp I have always enjoyed making things out of trash, which is kind of an odd thing, but I, I make books out of trash. Um, I'm a preservation person, so I'm supposed to be thinking about long-term uh, you know, life of the books. And I do that for all of your books, because the Library of Congress, of course, is your collection. And I try to do the very best stewardship of your tax dollars that I can. Um, but I like to make things uh, different. And so I really connected with, uh, with the Vijia people. Um, with the opening of Cuba, this is, um, this is the way we store the materials at the Library of Congress. We make boxes for them. Am I doing on time? I'm doing OK. Um, and we do layers. Can you see? So, we, we, we make these trays with cutouts so that the book will perfectly fit in and be supported. And then we can put three or four layers uh, of the books um, in the, in, on a shelf in one of these boxes. And they all pull out. So the one you're seeing right there on top, that's the Emily Dickinson book I was telling you about. So it comes with a tree that is um, and a rock. And the rock will hold the tree at the base so that the tree won't fall over. So you can do this whole design. So you have the rock, and then that's the actual book. And then see the uh, on the far left there um, is actually this um, piece of organza that has um, stars on it. And that sits over top of the, of the house when it's, when it's made. And the rest of the house is underneath there. Did I do it again? No. Did I? Dang. I, am, I pushed the same button. I swear I did. But I think maybe that means it's time to stop looking up here and come look down here. That's what I think. Maybe that was the last one, and I pushed the right button, and I didn't make a mistake again.
last that one. That was the last one. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. It was the last one. So, so open for questions, and I see that there are some. Do you want to do a mic? So this is being recorded, so they want to have a mic for the questions? Or I can repeat the questions. Yeah, is it working? OK, OK, OK. Many books they've published, and what a you great said they question! In the eighties, nineteen eighty-five was the first was when they first started publishing, and I have some of the earlier ones really on um, this mimeograph. You can see the changes now because now they're using computers and doing design work with computers. It's really quite wonderful. They're, those the computers came from Spain, so they just recently did a, a bibliography. Um, they celebrated their twentieth. Uh, anniversary and then their 25th anniversary and you know coming coming up so that so um, um, I don't I don't know the total number but they have done a bibliography and that bibliography their very earliest bibliography I had a copy of that and I donated it to the Library of Congress because I couldn't find any other copies in the United States and I felt like it was really important for uh, the bibliography to be in a research library, so I donated it to the Library of Congress. I did make a photocopy of it. Um, but they have a more recent one that's come out uh, in, I guess, 2015 um, that's like this thick. Um, so they've done a lot of publishing. Now, you said this is taking place in Matanzas. Right. Are these books getting to other parts of Cuba? Yes, they certainly are. And there are other public libraries that, that have them. So it's only at public libraries? Um, well, or, can or, or individual Cubans who buy them as well. So there are other copies in, in Cuba as well as purchased by tourists. Okay, but what about the Cuban people themselves? Can they afford to buy these books? Well, there are two prices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's the Cuban price. So that's a great question. Can the Cubans afford to buy them? Yes. And originally that's that was the purpose. They weren't they didn't they were writing and publishing so that they could share their literature with other Cubans. And so they are distributed around the country and they went into different uh, public libraries so that they would be available that way too. And it was only I mean, it's because it's on the way to Veradero that, that tourists would stop and buy. And so I would buy with American dollars. Because, of course, the, the, the dual economy allows you to buy different things in, in Cuba. If you only have your Cuban pesos or you have your uh, ration book, you get certain things. And you can get other things at the dollar stores. I mean, for more than a dollar. But so. Um, so they did have that dual economy, but they would always, t for the Cubans, they, they would sell them in, in pesos. Now, I haven't been back recently, but I see that Linda is here who has been uh, back to Cuba, who has been to Cuba more, much more recently than I have. Um, because I work at the Library of Congress, um, um, I could go as a tourist, but I can't go, uh, the, the library will not allow me to go uh, officially. Is there a publication in the works that will catalog all of their work? Or did I hear you say that there was a publication? Yeah, there's a, there's a bibliography that they created. And the Library of Congress has done a really great job of cataloging the materials that they have in their collection, um, which you can find on WorldCat. Um, or you can, you can look, if you just go to the Library of Congress website and search on, on Bahia, all of, the, all of the titles that we have will come up. And when you look at the cataloging that is done, the Barbara Dash has done a great deal of the cataloging um, of these materials. And she does this description that she says, you know, what is the, the accoutrement, as I call it. So for this one, she would say that there's a detachable fan. And she would say um, that there's lace on the front. So she does a really, really good description. Um, I mean, all of the books aren't at the Library of Congress, but, but really good descriptions um, that other libraries, as they purchase them, are, are using for that. Um, so I don't, um, 
uh, the bibliography, I assume that Library of Congress has that bibliography. I suppose I should check because I have two copies of it. Um, but I'll think about that later. But there is a, excuse me? No, there are not, but because they're all within copyright. So we couldn't digitize these. I mean, the Library of Congress is digitizing lots and lots of collections, but we're very, very conservative in terms of copyright. We're not Google. Um, so, well, I mean, Copyright Office is, right, is our sister, is part of the Library of Congress. Um, and so we're very respectful of both international copyright as well as, as uh, US copyright. So we would not digitize these unless they were made available to us. But if you go on to the web and just search under Vigia, or Adiciones Vigia, you'll, you'll find lots and lots of images of, of the books. It doesn't do justice. You've got to come up and really look at them. I'm, I missed a little bit of I missed a little bit at the beginning, so if you covered this, I apologize. But were, have any of the books ever, it maybe particularly in the beginning, been banned or destroyed by the government? What a great question. Um, not that I know of, but in the early days, they were very careful uh, about N not being real public. So there's a whole network. I mean, there's a whole network of all sorts of ways of getting things done in Cuba uh, because, of the, because of the government. Um, I mean, you stand in line to use your ration cards or, or what little money, and you get, into the, you get into the store, and the only thing that's there are size 12 shoes, and you wear size 4. So what do you do? You've been standing in line for two hours, and now there's only the only thing you can buy are size 12 shoes. You're going to buy those size 12 shoes, and then you're going to trade them for size 4 with somebody else. So whatever is available in the stores is what people would buy, and then they would have this whole network where they would trade around things to find what they needed. So sort of the same way the books got passed around and carried around and moved around um, so that the government, I mean, in the government, I mean, must know what's going on. They just don't do anything because there's, there's this economy that keeps everything going, keeps the cars running, keeps, the, keeps people from dying of, of starvation because they're trading for different food or whatever it is that they need. Um, and so I would, so as far as I know, nothing was ever banned. At, but they, they certainly pushed the limits because they did publish authors who otherwise would never have been published in Cuba. Um, and they got away with it. Not only did they get away with it, but they flourished and now have been taken over by the government publishing. Are you aware of any um, artistic publications like this that are done in America? Um, well, art students. Um, this is a, this, this type of publication that's made out of, of um, common materials is, is not uncommon in Latin America. So we have a collection, a Brazilian collection of their cardboard uh, pieces that um, have been picked up. I mean, the cardboard's just been picked up from the trash, and then they, they paint on it and write on it, and, they, and that's a publication. But it's a one of a, it tends to be a one-of-a-kind, um, whereas these are editions. So um, there are small edition uh, collaboratives or cooperatives um, they have a variety of names in, in other Latin American countries and in the Caribbean. But this is, I mean, they have ISBN numbers. They have ISSN numbers. They're like a real publisher. And they want it to be a real publisher. And so in that way, they are different from these, um, these uh, small publications that are just a way to communicate 
um, that they do, or, or, and for art and that they sell, like in Brazil or in Colombia um, and other countries. Um, there are other publishing houses, small publishing houses, elsewhere in other provinces in Cuba, and I have some of their materials too. They do much, much smaller um, editions, and I didn't bring any of those tonight. I just wanted to show off the HIA. Um, but, but small publishing has been around for a long time because people want to be able to share their creative ideas. Um, and they do that in, in a wide variety of, of ways within their means. But I think that what uh, Vahia does is, is exceptional across what I have seen. That happened, um, it's my understanding, um, that that happened about five or six years ago. And has that affected the production? It, the content. The content, yes. I would say yes, the content. But, so there are more Cuban um, authors now that are published, um, which is a good thing. Um, fewer, so... There's a Swedish publication. When the, during the Russian time, there was a lot of, um, I mean, there's, uh, there, are, uh, there was this Tolstoy poems. There was, uh, you know, uh, Pushkin. There's a wonderful Pushkin book. Um, so there was, and then translation from Russian to Spanish. Um, there, were, there was Swedish, from Swedish to Spanish. Um, and that's less so now. That's my understanding from what I'm seeing of the publications that are coming out. It's more, it's more um, Cuban, but also the Cuban-Americans. So um, Ruth Bahar is still doing thing, and uh, Jose Cozar has done a number of pieces, too, and he's a Cuban-American. So come on up. I feel, don't be scared of me. Come up. You know, the applause is really for the books. Yeah. So